Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and uh, Alex. Well, he, I, I don't know if he's necessarily in a coffin, but uh, I do wonder if he's a vampire once in a while, uh, because he works all night, and then he sleeps during the day. Mm, I don't know. I like him already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of figured you, you might. Uh, but in case you are wondering uh, who is actually joining me on the show today, I am very happy to say uh, that we have the uh, World of Darkness brand marketing manager, and the host of L.A. by Night on Twitch, here to talk a little bit about Vampire the Masquerade, Jason Carl. Jason, Hello. coming on. Yes. Uh, so happy to have you on. I was, uh, was kind of hoping to get you on like before Halloween because, you know, Vampire, mm-hmm. Halloween, all of that stuff. But you were well really? away. Uh, I never, I never <laughs> thought of that connection. That's, that's remarkable. We, I've got to do something with that. Thank you. Yes. I appreciate, I appreciate the idea. Yeah, I know. This is, this is I'll give you full credit. Okay, this is news. Uh, but uh, but you were you were way away, over over in the Europe. I was. I was in Stockholm, Sweden, because uh, World of Darkness uh, has its headquarters there. Or I should say, uh, the company that owns World of Darkness, Paradox Interactive, uh, mm. is headquartered in Stockholm, Sweden. So I travel there several times a year to uh, touch base with my World of Darkness colleagues. And uh, all my working associates, and also the uh, the brand manager who is in charge of World of Darkness, and who is my boss. Oh, <laughs> that that whole thing, yeah, the, that the, whole the, thing. Like, I I do want to know a lot more about World of Darkness and the setting and everything, but I really just I really just wanted to start uh, with you, and I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, how you actually got into tabletop gaming at the start. What sure. really drew you to tabletop gaming at the beginning? At the very beginning, in the time before time, yes. uh, I was a young boy growing up in the state of Maine, way over on the, in the northeast corner of mm-hmm. the United States. Mm-hmm. And I discovered Dungeons and Dragons at a, at a young age. I was in junior high school, and I discovered it completely at random, totally accidentally. Friends taught me to play, and I discovered a love of worlds I didn't know existed before I found D&D. And Dungeons & Dragons got me interested in things like history and literature and yeah. fantasy and science fiction and architecture and political systems and art. All the good things that uh, you get introduced to, to through role-playing games. It was a lifelong dream that started then, way back in the day of my somewhat misspent youth, that uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to work in that field. I wanted to I wanted to work on Dungeons & Dragons. I wanted to work on role-playing games and try to share what I loved about them with, well, with everybody, really. Well, that's, that's good. It seems like that worked out for the most part. Uh, you know, I've been extraordinarily lucky. Yeah. Uh, very, very fortunate. Nobody, nobody achieves any kind of uh, successful results in life without help. And often it's yeah. help from... A lot of different people, and I, I have certainly had my, more than my fair share of help and support from people along the way. So I don't Excellent. want to suggest that I did it completely by myself. I didn't. No one does. Yeah, everybody needs uh, some people around them that are going to be able to get them there. So a little bit about like your time before uh, you were at White Wolf. What, what what are some of the early projects you worked on in the industry? Sure. In the industry, uh, I worked uh, first on Magic the Gathering at Wizards of the Coast. Oh, yes. I was um, one of the people who was working on um, what we called organized play, mm-hmm. which is a fancy way of saying Magic the Gathering tournaments and um, retail matches. When I joined Wizards of the Coast, that was just an idea. We, we didn't really have a, a way to help people play Magic either competitively or even casually. At, at retail stores. And so my job was to help this team develop what would later become Friday Night Magic at retail stores and the Magic Gathering Pro Tour, the Grand yeah. Prix, the Duelist Convocation, I think we called it back then, which is the membership organization of Magic players. We had to invent um, the way to do it and also the scoring systems and the reporting methods and the community that developed around it grew incredibly quickly 
very fast, much faster than we could keep up. And it, it led us a merry chase for a long time. That was exhilarating. That was thrilling. Along the way, though, I discovered a role-playing game, Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, I was an avid D&D player, of course, as we talked about. And, uh, but I was also a big horror and vampire fan, really enthused about the horror genre. And I saw a copy of Vampire the Masquerade in a retail store, a game store, one day. I was drawn to the very cool gothic horror cover with the green marble and the red rose on it. And um, I bought it. I read it very quickly. And um, I couldn't find anybody to play with me. Nobody wanted to play Vampire the Masquerade. It was so disappointing. Yes. Uh, everybody was too having too much fun with um, with Dungeons and Dragons. I didn't discover vampire players until a few months after I bought the book, actually, and I discovered them through Vampire the Masquerade live action role playing game. LARP. Mm. There was a vampire LARP in uh, near Seattle that was oh, huge wow. and healthy. Again, accidentally found it out completely accidentally playing through them. Fast forward a little bit while I was still at Wizards of the Coast, I was able to make contact with White Wolf which was based in Atlanta at the mm. time. And one of the game developers there gave me my first shot at a, at a freelance role-playing game writing opportunity for Vampire. After I left Wizards of the Coast, I stayed very much in contact with White Wolf and kept involved in the World of Darkness, the LARP community, I, uh, storytelling at home, my own home tabletop games. Eventually, uh, I started designing LARP games under license for White Wolf. When oh. Paradox Interactive acquired the license several years ago, I saw that as an opportunity to take everything I had learned as a game designer and a writer and a marketer and a business owner and uh, put it to work for the for the game and the game world that had really fired my imagination for so long. So I came on board as a producer for the Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition role-playing game. And uh, also as marketing manager. And now I'm doing brand marketing managing for the World of Darkness all up. That was yeah. a longer answer than you wanted, I think. But That's at least fine. It, it gets you through <laughs> the big beat. That's good. That's the this is your life portion of the show. So we've, mm -hmm. <laughs> we've actually taken care of yep. that pretty quickly. That finally uh, gets us to where we're at, White Wolf and with, with World of Darkness. And now you're also, you're sort of known as, as a storyteller in that setting. With LA Bizarrely by enough, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, that was not intentional either. I've been a fan of tabletop streaming games for quite a while, and of course, I, I like most people, I, I have fell in love with Critical Role and was sure. amazed at how they showed us what could be done with mm -hmm. tabletop streaming medium. So um, when I took on the, the role of brand marketing manager, I realized Empire really needs a tabletop streaming show too. We need to show people how much fun it is to play Vampire and all the different ways that you can enjoy it. So um, we approached uh, Deacon Sundry and mm -hmm. uh, we entered into a partnership with them to create and produce L.A. by Night, which is our Vampire the Masquerade tabletop stream. We needed a storyteller and uh, I had no intention of being the storyteller uh, at the time. Yeah. It, worked out, it worked out that way, again, almost completely accidentally but very happily for everybody. Yes. At, least I, at least I hope it's happy. <laughs> I, th I think it worked we'll out see. okay. I, I've, I've, I've watched a little bit of L.A. by night, and I, I really liked, like the tone that you said. I, I, Thank you very much. I, yeah. uh, I wanted to do something unique to Vampire yeah. and uh, somewhat different than many other tabletop streams. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring in all the experience that I had creating and running live-action games, of course, which are very theatrical and very dramatic. And really lend themselves well to the dark, gritty, neo noir mood of vampire. Yes. And so far, so good, I think. No, that's good. I've I've only attempted to run a game one time, and uh, and I feel like my style was mostly. Uh, and then there's uh there's a monster, and you destroy. Go go fight the monster. <laughs> and <laughs> your 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 method is much more like. What would you like to do? Okay. Now, <laughs> well, yeah. it's yeah. um, I see World of Darkness very much as um as a sandbox storytelling game. Yeah, there are an incredible number of options, and I would much prefer the players decide what their characters are interested in. Mm -hmm. And my role becomes I think of myself as the interpreter of the World of Darkness. I'm here to interpret yes. what the World of Darkness wants mm -hmm. because it wants it wants things. 
for. Yes. Generally not a very good thing. My <laughs> job is to adjudicate where what the world of darkness wants and what the characters want. And that space in between is where all the fun happens. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I took a couple notes just, just watching you for, for future reference. Uh, just like when characters give a general idea, this is kind of what I want to do, and and you kind of try to elaborate on it and see if that's what they're just just trying to flesh out the details a little bit with them before you proceed. Uh, I was like, oh, that that's a good idea. You're just kind of working with them to get a little bit more of a flavor of what's actually happening. I was like, oh yeah, the, remember that for the future. So thank you for that. Oh, cool. I'm glad it. Uh, I'm glad it was helpful. Uh, yes. I know the. I know that particular style isn't for everyone. Personally, I like the atmosphere qualities of it, so that's good. But now, uh, speaking of World of Darkness, yeah, I, I want to. I want to talk. That, how about that World of Darkness? How about them World of Darknesses? Yeah. Um, I can you tell me? Just give me an idea of what the World of Darkness is like for someone who's not familiar with it. Sure, I absolutely can. And it's a question we get asked surprisingly frequently. Really, people want to know. You know, what is it? Uh, it sounds like a cool story world, but, you know, so I always start with a question. And the question is, what if monsters are real? Right. The world of darkness yeah. is our world. It's the world outside your window right now. It's the world outside your door tonight. But in the world yes. of darkness, vampires and magicians and werewolves and even worse creatures are real. And they're mm -hmm. all living among us. An entire supernatural world hidden in plain sight. But more importantly, you are one of these monsters pretending to be human, mm -hmm. fighting for survival or political supremacy in a neo-noir, dark and mysterious world of dramatic struggle. It's a world of... You know, ancient secrets and conspiracies and upheaval and it's a world of danger and excitement and romance mm -hmm. and the horror yeah. is is very personal right you're not um you're not yeah. running away from the monster you you are the monster you're an anti-hero who's afraid of yourself and what you're capable of and you are afraid of the mysteries and the horror around you that you may not have a lot of control of. i think it's also important to say that the World of Darkness is a story that's about a deep reflection over the consequences and the limits of our own humanity. Oh, all right. That that feels like a much, much more deep. Well, that feels like a much deeper philosophical idea mm -hmm. about the about the nature of of almost like you're trying to explore humanity through things that are normally seen as inhuman. That is an excellent shorthand version. Okay, that, good. That's, 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 precisely, uh, that's precisely it, really. Beautiful. I feel that um, by telling stories about monsters, mm -hmm. we learn to recognize what is monstrous and mm -hmm. avoid becoming monsters ourselves. That's a very interesting allegory. I like that. I like that. Inside of the world of darkness, if we were specifically talking about vampire, what would you say vampires are like in this setting? I've seen so many versions of vampires throughout the years, but what sure. are vampires like in World of Darkness? That's an interesting question because um, you might be aware that many of the modern interpretations of vampires in popular media mm. come from the original Vampire the Masquerade. In fact, there's a documentary film about it called oh. The World of Darkness Documentary pretty sure it's available on Amazon Prime and Vimeo and a lot of other streaming services. And the mm -hmm. documentary traces the origins of Vampire the Masquerade back in the early 1990s. It follows the story of it through tonight and shows exactly where it influenced movies and TV and comic books and graphic novels and yeah. art. So many of the things that people are familiar with in yeah. vampire entertainment started with Vampire the Masquerade. Not everything, of course, right. but enough, enough that I think uh, many people would be a little surprised to find out exactly how much they already know about vampires in our story right. world. So what are they like? Yeah. So to answer the question really, really simply, mm -hmm. they are, of course, undead. Like the classic vampires of mythology and legend, they certainly drink blood. Each vampire is a part of a clan or a family, if you like. 
of vampires that shares certain common characteristics, physical abilities, and sometimes even a, a, a philosophical outlook on the world. Okay. And clan often determines part of your destiny in Vampire the Masquerade. Okay. The, the most important thing to know about vampires, though, is yeah. that they're hungry. And they are right. in, an eternal con- in an eternal conflict, an internal conflict, mm-hmm. between that hunger, or the beast, as they sometimes call it, and their own humanity. They are often struggling to preserve their humanity, and they do mm-hmm. some not very nice things in order to prevent themselves from doing even worse things as a result mm-hmm. of, that, of that hunger. So they're very conflicted creatures. You might say that Vampire the Masquerade is a, is a role-playing game. It's a very moral game about very immoral monsters. <laughs> All right. Just from watching a little bit of LA by Night, I did get the uh, idea that these are, these are people that are now struggling with this supernatural thing that is, is sort of almost a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of scenario. It's, it's, it's a, an internal beast that they're trying to, tr- trying to cope with in some way uh, that's a good that's a that's a pretty good explanation a shorthand explanation they of course don't understand what it is okay the empires in the world of darkness don't even agree on where they came from they're not sure uh they have oh. many many different origin stories and explanations for how vampires came to be in the world but nobody knows if they're you know actually right or not right. they certainly don't understand exactly what the nature of the beast inside them is. so each vampire tends to develop their own way of coping with it. That's, that's interesting. Where the, that's where the stories happen. Now, I, I'm interested in some of the clans. Uh, my, only yeah. real, my, my only real experience with Vampire was I, I played Bloodlines. Bloodlines was yeah. such, a, such a fantastic was PC good. game. What a, yeah. what a great story. That yeah, was. it really was. Looking forward to Bloodlines, too. Um, I am, me, I am... me, too. <laughs> have, you caught any, have you caught any of the um, demo trailers or the clan reveals or the uh, seen a little bit. interviews coming out of Paradox, uh, PDXCon or um, E3 just, this year? I have, I have seen just a little bit. Just, when they annou- just, just, from, just from when they announced Bloodlines, too, though, it's like, I'm probably sold already. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you, you and me both. Yeah, uh, and uh, if I remember correctly, I played a, a Toriador. If we're looking at mm, yeah. the closest, like to to human <laughs> that you could get uh, out of the clans that they gave you, um, mm. and at, at least that was the way it was presented to me. And mm-hmm. um, and uh, and I also got the impression, although I don't really necessarily know if that's true in the in the role playing game, the the tabletop yeah. game, is that uh, if you're a Nosferatu, kind of on hard mode. Because there's so many things you can't really do. Like, <laughs> the, the masquerade is kind right. of not applicable to you when you when you're a Nosferatu. But like for for you, what what do clans actually represent? What is the purpose of having a clan? What do you get out of it? Wow, what a great question. Let me think about that just for a second sure. before I answer. It's difficult to speak about clans without. Comp- Comparing it to other stories, other role-playing games, other ways of organizing story. In most role-playing games, and we have to remember that Vampire started as a role-playing game, one of the big assumptions is that uh, you would have a character class, a job, a role. In, in classic fantasy role-playing games, that might be the fighter or the thief or the wizard, right? right. Uh, in other role, role-playing games, it might be... You know, a you know, a space soldier or a healer. Even in video games, we have the idea of professions, right? Mm. That is generally the organizing principle of all playing games, whether they're tabletop or whether they're video games or something else. Right. Class or profession or role is the central organizing principle of play. Vampire mm. doesn't have that. Vampire uh. has clan. Families or uh, you know tribes or uh, vampires that are related through ancestry, mm-hmm. but not by choice. You don't get to choose what clan you're part of. When you're a mortal, when you become a vampire, that means a vampire chooses to make you one of them. They choose to turn you into one of the undead. Very often, I would say more often than not, you don't get the choice. You are chosen. 
And so you don't get to choose your job or your role in the world of darkness. The clans totally reinvent the idea of character classes. Uh, I remember um, Justin Akili, who uh, is the uh, really gifted game designer who uh, developed the third edition, the revised edition of Vampire. I remember him saying once that clans made the idea of character classes something expressly social. Sense of belonging inherent to the clans that you don't get in a character class because a fighter, a healer, a wizard, a space soldier, that's something you do. Yeah. A clan is what you are. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. passed to you generally, generationally through the vampire who made you. Let's say yeah. you, t- you talked about Toreador, right? So yes. you're, you play a Toreador. At some point, you were a normal human being, mm-hmm. a mortal. And right. one night you were chosen by a vampire and you were, you were made a Toreador. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, you're in this whole family of Toreador because you're your sire's sire is a Toreador and their sire's sire and their sire's sire yeah. all the way back. Yeah. So this, your fate is partly determined by a choice you never got to make. Uh, there's no occupation. There's no job uh, tied to your clan. You're a Toreador, but you could be a Toreador spy or a Toreador truck driver or a Toreador politician <laughs> or yeah. an artist or a chef. Uh, you mm-hmm. could be anything. It's not what you do. It's what you are. They don't prescribe your interactions with the world of darkness. They can give you some cute, some clues, yeah. but these are not built into the system itself. Yeah, because when I think about it, like if I, if I choose to be a fighter in D&D, I don't come from a long lineage of fighters. <laughs> I, might just, I might just pick up a right? sword one day and say, this is what I am now. Yeah, uh, but clans, you're a Toreador, a clan, suddenly <laughs> whatever sins of your sire are now visit upon you, their progeny. Your mm-hmm. sire is a Toreador and your sire embraced you. So now you're a Toreador forever. There's no way to change it. What do you do? How do you, how yeah. do you react to that? And if you're lucky, you're going to live, you're going to live forever, but you're yeah. going to live forever as a Toreador. Right, right, right. How am I going to cope with that? Uh, probably poorly. <laughs> if, if, if it's me, I think it's I think it's fair to say that players uh, who love Vampire the Masquerade identify with their clans very strongly. The clans connect us players to how we experience the world of art. They're the most. They're the single most important part of game design in Vampire the Masquerade. That actually does bring me to uh, more of a technical question. I know that you're not necessarily, you know, a, a designer, so to speak, on on uh, Vampire, but uh, I am curious about the mechanics, because World of Darkness has sure. a very interesting set of mechanics that it utilizes. Can you, can you tell me about sort of like the basics of that? Sure. Um, it's a dice pool game. It's certainly not the first dice pool game. I think the very first dice pool game is probably the original Ghostbusters licensed role-playing game. Oh, wow. And a, a dice pool game simply means that um, you're going to roll a handful of dice, and the number of dice that you roll is determined by adding certain combinations of scores on your character sheet, rolling the dice, and trying to hit a target number. And either, either the target number is fixed or variable. Everything revolves around that very simple task resolution system. In mm-hmm. Vampire the Masquerade 5th uh, edition, which is the edition that we uh, is now out into the world uh, from uh, Paradox Interactive and our, our publishing partner, Modifius Entertainment, over in the UK, yes. the target number is always six. So you're always looking for sixes on your dice pool of D10s. It's always D10s. Okay. I was wondering about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, what, what dice am I usually... So I've got D10s and I'm looking you're to have a six. You've got D10s. You're going to roll a handful of D10s. Mm-hmm. The number of D10s that you roll are dependent on the characteristics that you add together for your character sheet. Usually it's two characteristics, usually what we call two traits we call attributes and skills. Mm-hmm. And uh, you roll those together, and every six you get is a success. And you're looking for a certain number of successes. I it's see. It's more complicated, though, by a very elegant mechanic. Um, developed by Kareem Lamar at uh, Paradox Interactive. And uh, Kareem, well, in the early days of trying to figure out how we would update the rules for Vampire, Kareem started to uh, brainstorm around, well, what's the central concept of vampires? They drink yeah. blood. They're undead. They're always hungry for blood. Hungry. Hunger. 
and uh, he he developed the idea that we would not measure blood the way you measure hit points in D and D. It's not a, it's not a gas meter anymore the way it used to be. <laughs> okay. it, we would now measure your hunger. How hungry are you? Okay. And the higher your hunger score, the more you would risk doing those terrible things that I talked. The more mm. likely it would become that you would lose your cool do something really catastrophically vampiric and get yes. into lots of cool trouble that drives an awesome story. Excellent. I want it all. <laughs> so we, the way we do that in, in Vampire the Masquerade Fifth Edition in V5 is hunger dice. And okay. you can have anywhere from zero to five hunger dice. Mm. Uh, when you don't have any hunger dice in front of you, you're not hungry. You've just eaten. I'm good. Yes. When you have one hunger die in front of you, yeah, you know, you, you could eat, you're feeling a little peckish here. You get yeah. five hunger dice in front of you, and you're more than, you ever get so hungry that you're angry? Angry? Oh, yeah. This is even worse than that. This is, you're going to lose your cool immediately if you don't get some food. I'm hangry. Yeah. Exactly, you're hangry. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a very cool and fun risk management sub game. And we did that for, for one really key reason, and that was, not, not that blood points aren't fun. Sure. Empire the Masquerade had a blood pool for many, many years, and people had fun with it. The, mm. the problem for us was that it's impossible to describe how, yeah. what does blood 10 feel like? What's, mm-hmm. one, what's blood 1 feel like? No one knows. It's too abstract. But everyone yeah. knows what it feels like to be hungry. We've all yeah. skipped a meal. Yeah. We have all gone too far between uh, snacks. We've yeah. all felt the pangs of hunger so strongly that we snapped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is something we can describe to each other and build stories. That's, that's interesting. So what you were trying to do, this is specifically, this started with 5e, the hunger system. That's correct. correct. Okay. Uh, so I, I like that, though, because uh, so you were trying to make it more relatable to a person who's not necessarily a vampire themselves. That they could understand. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's fun to pretend to be a, a, you know, an undead nocturnal monster, but yeah. it's hard to describe how it feels. And the yes. hunger dice is a way to help us make the world feel real. Uh, that's, that's good, because it, uh, it does seem to be a typical problem with RPGs that sometimes I don't really know how to relate to my characters if they're so disparately different than mm. me. As, especially if there's like this whole underground... Uh, going on that I I am not familiar with, so I can totally understand why you wanted to go with hunger. I uh, like you know because I, I mean I I have blood, but I don't have uh, an interest in drinking it. But hunger, I can totally see that. I don't know, like for for a vampire, is blood like a uh, like uh, like potato chips or something, or is that like, <laughs> or is it is it more substantial than that? That's a good question. I'm not sure that the game specifically answers it. Okay. Uh, what we do know is that it's more than just, it's more than just food. It's not just people. The the hunger for it is so. If you um if you don't eat food, if you or I don't eat food, we will suffer. We will suffer for it, right? We'll get hungry. We'll get hunger pangs, and our bodies eventually, if we don't eat, will will start to die. Of course, mm-hmm. you got. I'm not sure exactly how long a person can live without food, but not very mm-hmm. long. No, not a few long. weeks, perhaps a month, mm-hmm. if you're lucky. If you've got some water. Um, vampires, however, in the world of darkness, experience that hunger as a deep craving. It's always there. It's always pressing in on them uh, from the inside out. The beast is always demanding to be fed. It's a a constant desire. Mm -hmm. And the longer they go without feeding, the Mm -hmm. worse it gets. Much, much worse than denying yourself that extra bag of potato chips. Okay, excellent. I, I kind of figured that it must be more substantial just from the nature of it, but you never know. Maybe, maybe I'm a vampire who just like feels peckish once in a while. You never do know, right? <laughs> yeah, you never know. I guess it depends on how you're playing your character, too. Besides the hunger system, are there any other things uh, that changed in 5e from previous versions of the game? So we, uh, we did overhaul the disciplines, the supernatural powers, uh, okay. and uh, update them. We wanted, a, we wanted, in general, a much more, what we thought of as a more streamlined system, something that would play a little bit faster. All the designers loved Vampire the Masquerade and, and Werewolf the Apocalypse yeah. and all the other World of Darkness role-playing games. We had a lot of fun with it. 
we really wanted to try to make the game system play a little bit faster and to reduce the number of rules that were used in any given situation. There are, we did allow for plenty of optional rules storytellers and players can introduce into the game if they want a more granular system. And one of the ways that we did that was rebuilding the discipline system. We removed initiative. There's no initiative from in the uh, in the game now. Everybody everybody acts at the same time, which is both wonderful and, and difficult. Right. And uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we introduced several really cool optional rules um, to make things go even faster. We introduced uh, one role resolution mechanics. Designer uh, Ken Hyde introduced the uh, three three roles and out rule which is all conflicts can be, the idea is that all conflicts can be resolved in just three roles, no matter what it is. I, I, I can see that. Well, one, that kind of helps to streamline things a little bit more, so you don't wind up in really long, drawn-out sessions trying to figure it. And it feels like it has, has some sort of sense of emergency, too. We definitely want to try to give it an uh, imminent sense of danger. Every, yeah. every combat encounter should have the potential for disaster. It, yeah, it certainly should, and it usually does. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, that's very interesting, though, uh, the idea that everybody acts at the same time. Um, Alex had talked about one of his home rules when he was playing D&D uh, was that the, he, he still had everybody roll for initiative, but everybody was acting at the same time. Mm. So even though you rolled initiative over somebody else, uh, you know, the, the monster still gets a chance to act, even though it would normally die, uh, because it might still be able to slap you. Uh, there are so many different ways to play tabletop role-playing games. and Everybody has their own personal favorite way. I don't believe there's any such thing as, you know, as bad fun or wrong fun. Everybody yeah. should, should play exactly the way they want to. We created 5th edition with the idea that faster would be fun. And yeah. I think that's worked, that's worked for us so far. Mm-hmm. But um, I do want to stress that if you do want to complicate it, slow it down, there are ways to do it. It's okay. a very surprisingly flexible system. Yeah, it definitely sounds that way. And I think one of the things that really appealed to me was that it, it's not just a, you know, ding, I'm level two kind of system. It's much more decentralized than that in terms of building up your character. Yeah, That's true. You accumulate experience points, of course, just like in any role-playing game, but you can apply them across uh, a broad variety of traits and really customize how your character progresses. Wanted to ask you just a, a few questions, uh, like toward Uh-oh. the end. <laughs> no, no, just wanted to ask you a few questions, not not necessarily on mechanics, but actually on the the role playing aspect, the storytelling sure. aspect. Of things. Uh, so when when you're playing, let's say we're in L. A. by night, for instance, good example of that. Actually, um, when you're running that game, what are you trying yeah. to keep in mind as a storyteller? I'm not. I want to make sure I'm answering the right question. Okay. Okay. What do you? Can you elaborate just a little, little bit, or give me I, a point I, of comparison? I think I think I can. In terms of like driving the story forward, what are you trying to keep in mind for the actual storyline hmm. to keep things moving uh, forward? Uh, that's a great question, and now I understand what you mean. The chief thing I try to keep in mind is what my NPCs want, mm-hmm. what motivates them, what they care about, what they will do, what they won't do, or what they think they won't. And uh, I try to let their motivations, their ambitions, their desires, their hopes, their fears inform the decisions I make when I interpret the world of darkness. The players and their player characters also have wants, needs, desires, hopes, dreams, ambitions. And those should be the primary motivations and catalysts for the story. I interpret the world, as I mentioned, and I do that by keeping in mind what the NPCs want, because what the NPCs want and what our player characters want are rarely the same things, right? So the friction of the story, the drama, happens where those two elements clash. Player agency is critically important in in creating a good story. Mm -hmm. It's also extraordinarily important to remember that um, the reason we play tabletop role-playing games is to create a story together. It's a shared experience. I'm not presenting a story for the player characters to react to. Right. They're making choices, and I'm reacting to those choices, and I'm gotcha. reacting in a way that I think the world would respond realistically. 
Now, uh, let's say you have a new player like me or a, a storyteller, and they're getting into World of Darkness. What do they need to know starting out? What do they need to know? Do you mean, are you asking? Like, like if, if you were to give advice to new storytellers, new players, just picking up Vampire, okay. and they're, they're, they're a blank slate. They're, they're like me, basically. Would you have any advice on what to remember, what to think about when you're playing the game? You bet. I get this question fairly often from uh, people who have discovered Vampire accidentally the way I did or who watch Jelly by Night and want to give it a try or who get introduced to it by a friend. And they often ask, where do I start? What do I do? What I always tell them, the advice I always give is communicate. The first thing you should do is get together with your friends who are going to play with you. Talk about the story, what stories you want to tell. Talk about what stories you don't want to tell. Everybody comes to the tabletop role-playing game uh, environment with an idea of what's fun. And I mm -hmm. think it's super important to share your ideas of what is fun together mm -hmm. so that you know yeah. what everybody's expectations are. And that's really true in a game like Vampire because it's a little different than some role-playing games. You're playing a monster, and you're playing a monster yeah. who is quite possibly not a very nice creature. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the game can generate stories that often bring the player characters into conflict. Mm -hmm. That means it's really important to talk to each other and set expectations clearly. Talk about how we're going to approach this game and what story are we going to tell together. That's mm -hmm. where you've got to start. Now, you could argue that that applies to any tabletop role-playing game, not just Vampire. Right, right, and, right. And I, and I would agree with you. I mm -hmm. think that's probably true. But I think it's sure. super important in a game like Vampire because of the nature of the of the conflicts in the story. Something that I, I would say just from our conversation, especially when yeah. we started talking about the the nature of, you know, uh, the, the humanity of it all. Like my normal assumption uh, would be that I have to try and play almost like a monster, like a beast. But I almost okay. get the impression that actually I have to remember my humanity in order to make this work better. It certainly it depends on what you want from the game experience. If you come to Vampire and you really want to explore that um, difficult intersection between beast and humanity, then yeah, you're going to want to remember that you are, are a human trying not to become a monster. Right. Uh, if you want to, if you want to tell a story about something else, revenge, revenge, romance, occult, right. mystery, politics. You might come to the table with a very different set of expectations and needs from the game, and you got to talk about those too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know our time is a little short, but I do have one question to kind of sure. close us out. Just a little bit of a mind experiment, but let's say you were going to be a player in Vampire that you were building mm. a character that you were building a character right now. Let's just say oh, this we're is awesome. I never get to play, so this is cool. Yeah. This is cool. Okay, good. This, this is fun. So let's say we're building a character for you right now. I'm wondering what clan would you want to be and how would you want to play your character? Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat because okay. uh, I don't, I think that um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's useful advice to tell people how I would approach it because okay. as I mentioned a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. it's a collaborative event. The character choices that I have in mind, the clan I might choose, the, um, the ambitions for that character, the mm -hmm. desires might not be compatible with what the other players at the table want to play or what the story the storyteller wants to share with them. So right. It's really fair of me to make my character in a vacuum like that. However, right. mm -hmm. however, because <laughs> it's such a great question, I'll answer it in a different way. Okay. I'll tell you what my favorite clan is. All right. My Excellent. favorite clan is the Ventru, the Ventru clan. That's right. Okay. They are. Um, they have been my favorite clan. I think ever since I started playing Vampire the Masquerade, they're a complicated clan. They work hard to maintain a reputation for genteel behavior, for leadership, for a sense of honor. They have this great sense of noblesse oblige, but they're deeply flawed. They mm -hmm. really believe that they know what's best for everybody, yeah. and they certainly see themselves as the the rightful leaders of vampire society, of kindred society, and uh, they are the self-appointed uh, enforcers um, of tradition. And that conviction that they're always right 
of course, makes them um, sometimes narrow-minded and uh, deeply flawed in their outlook. And I love telling stories with uh-huh. Ben True because they live at that terrible intersection of overconfident and noble leadership. There is something really attractive about deeply flawed characters to play. Oh, for sure, right? Yeah. There's, there's, there's so many favorites. Who yeah. wants to play a perfect person? That'd be <laughs> who, who really wants to play the, the absolute badass that could just do everything all the time? Sometimes, sometimes I want to feel like I have a limitation. <laughs> that I, that I have personal ones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I want to I wanna thank uh, you for coming on the show, Jason, uh, and explaining to me a lot about World of Darkness and about Vampire. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's been very enlightening, and perhaps very soon I'll, I'll get to play. Uh, I and, hope so. uh, yeah, and uh, and if so, I'm sure everyone and their mother will know about it. Um, I'll, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll be really curious to know how your first game goes once you do play. Yeah. So make sure to reach out and, and let me know. I think that would be really cool to find okay. out. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's been a great experience. Yeah, and uh, if anyone was uh, wondering how to get in touch with you or uh, where they could follow you online or learn mm-hmm. more about Vampire, where could they go? Oh, I am I am so easy to stalk online. It's <laughs> it's not even funny. I I use the same handle everywhere, and that handle is vampires in vino. That's vampires, the letter N, V I N O. Vampires yes. in vino, and that is because uh, I also really enjoy wine, not just yes. vampires. I've seen some of your stuff, and uh, <laughs> you almost you almost like you're you're pairing vampires with with wine. It, it it almost feels like that is a good pairing anyway, and it makes perfect sense. When like I'm I'm playing a vampire, what wine goes while I'm playing with a vampire? Thank uh, you very much. I, I have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I I can tell. Uh, okay, so vampires and vino basically everywhere. Um, if uh, if 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 folks wanted to uh, follow LA by night, catch that. When do you actually stream that on Twitch? Uh, we stream when we're when the season is uh, when the season is active. We yes. stream on Friday nights. Um, at eight o'clock, um, okay. and the best way to find out w- when uh, seasons begin is to go to our Twitter, which is uh, LA by Night, where yeah. that's where we announce everything official. And uh, if anyone wanted to catch up on White Wolf and World of Darkness, uh, website that they could go to, they go to worldofdarkness.com. And of okay. course, we are all over social media. We have um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Not mm-hmm. only for the World of Darkness but all of our game genres as well. Uh, and of course, uh, if you want to catch anything about Delve, you can go over to delvecast.com and uh, make sure to click on our Patreon. Uh, and uh, thank you to our Shiny Level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. And you can catch us on Twitter. I am at Titanium. Alex is at EXP Limited. And the show is at Delve Podcast. And find us on all the podcast apps. You know that stuff. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, Jason, Jason, I want to thank you. I've said it so many times. It's like, yeah, you know what the rest of this spiel is. <laughs> um, Jason, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy day to come and uh, talk to me. You bet. It was my great pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. Excellent. We're really happy that you were able to stop by. And uh, so from all of us here at Delve, thank you for joining us. And we will see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.